Palestine, to Egypt and Ethiopia. And as the word spread, the dread spread amongst the Jews as well. So they didn't all get it the same day, but they all got it. Susa was in confusion that day. The people were asking, just not only the Jews, but those who were Persians, what in the world is going on? Why has this thing been passed? What's the purpose behind this? Who's behind this? What's going on? So the, the city was in confusion. Meanwhile, only the king and Haman understood. And only Haman really understood. But in every province where the news got out, there was great mourning. And let's see, back, back to verse 3 again. There was mourning among the Jews, fasting, weeping, and wailing. Notice that fasting is mentioned, but not prayer. Now, we normally associate fasting and prayer together. So why is it not mentioned here? Well, remember that in the book of Esther, God is not mentioned in any way, shape, form, or fashion. None of the names of God are there. No, there's no reference to God. The, in fact, we're going to get as closest to it here at the end of chapter 4. God is not mentioned. So that leads some to think that a Jew didn't write it, but rather it was copied from the Persian records. I don't think that's true. I think it was written like this without that mention to underscore and to emphasize that though God is not mentioned, his hand is in all of it. And so I think that's, that's part of the purpose behind it. Next week, uh, we're going to take off and go to Texas, see the kids and celebrate Valentine's with them and let my son and daughter-in-law have a, a, few, a night or two off. And David's going to teach next week, and he's going to talk about God's providence. And that's throughout the whole book, well, throughout the whole Bible, but especially emphasized here in, uh, in, in the book of Esther. Now, it says they sat out in sackcloth and ashes. Now, we read about that an awful lot. Uh, those that go into mourning, they, they put on sackcloth, they put ashes on their head, or they sit in ashes, uh, preferably cold ashes. Sackcloth is made from either goat hair or camel hair. It is not comfortable. It's scratchy, it's itchy, it's, but it's designed to make one miserable on the outside and demonstrate their misery that's on the inside. A lot of times it was worn only as a loincloth. And so when we read about Mordecai here in a minute, he probably just had on a loincloth made of sackcloth. There are occasions where it was made into a tunic and worn under the robe. Go back and study Hezekiah. And there are others where they had you know, the whole cloth made out of, of a sackcloth. And the idea was that in, in sitting in the ashes, they would make some effort by doing so physically to identify with those who were deceased. Oftentimes, they would tear their garments, and they would, under the garments, you would see sackcloth. It was designed to be uncomfortable, designed to be miserable, designed to be a public show of internal grief. Today, we wear black. I remember, I think it was one August or late July, hot as it could be. We're standing out by the hearse at the cemetery, and the guy from the funeral home was sweating profusely. And I asked him, I said, whose idea was it that we should wear black at funerals? Because he just soaked in that hot sunshine, transferred right to the body. He said, I don't know. He said, but I'm about to burn up. And you could see he was sweating profusely. All of us were. Uh, so why did we wear black? Well, somebody decided that a long time ago. But that's how we do it today. They express their grief in other ways. But why the mourning? Why did this decree cause such a great amount of sorrow amongst the Jews? So go back to the map and just see this floating throughout the empire, this grief. It's not just the end of a race of people, but it's the end of God's promises. Turn, if you will, to Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 24 through 31. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, while you're turning, I want to remind you that this is the first Sunday of the month. And today we take up our collection to support uh, Mia and Angel at the City of Children. 
uh, in Ensenada, Mexico. And so if you can add that to your contribution, however you, you give, that would be greatly appreciated. We're keeping up uh, to pace with the amount that we give each month, and we really appreciate that. I know uh, the home does and the children do as well. In Deuteronomy, Moses is addressing Israel. And maybe we could all actually say second Israel because the people he's talking to are not the people that came out of Egypt. You remember the story? After they got the law and the Ten Commandments, they disobeyed God. When they got to Canaan, they said, we can't do it. The ten spies said we couldn't. Two said we could. And so God said, okay, for the next 40 years, you're going to walk around the countryside, move around. You won't go in. You'll die in the wilderness that you dread. And so they did. And so this is a new group. Now those... The oldest people in that group were 20 years old or so when all that started. So some of them came out of Egypt, but most of them did not. They were born in the wilderness. They did not know God's law as well. And so in Deuteronomy, which really means the second giving of the law, Moses repeats the law. But he also makes some prophecies about what they should do and what will happen if they don't do it. So in Deuteronomy chapter 4, let's begin in verse 24. The Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. When you become the father of children and children's children and have remained long in the land and act corruptly and make an idol in the form of anything and do that which is evil in the sight of the Lord your God so as to provoke, to provoke him to anger, I will call heaven and earth to witness against you today so that you will surely perish quickly from the land where you are going over the Jordan to possess it. You shall not live long on it, but will utterly be destroyed. That happened by the time of Esther. Verse 27. The Lord will scatter you among the peoples. The Assyrian Empire, the Babylonian Empire did that. You will be left few in number among the nations where the Lord drives you. There you will serve gods, the work of man's hands, wood and stone, which neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. But from there, very important, from there you will seek the Lord your God and you will find him if you search for him with all your heart and all your soul. When you are in distress and all these things have come upon you in the latter days, you will return to the Lord your God and listen to his voice. For the Lord your God is a compassionate God. He will not fail you nor destroy you nor forget the covenant with your fathers which he swore to them. Verse 24, God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Verse 31, God is a compassionate God. He cannot endure wickedness but he is full of mercy. If you will return and seek the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul, you will find him. He is not hiding. He's in plain open view if you'll look for him. And when you look for him, guess what? He will hear because he made promises to your fathers. Genesis 12. God said to Abraham, in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And we have for ages believed that that one statement first refers to Jesus Christ. And it does. Because in Jesus, the descendant of Abraham, go back to Matthew chapter 1. Abraham begat Isaac, Isaac begat Jacob, Jacob begat Judah and the boys, all the way down to Jesus. He is a descendant of Abraham. Go to Luke chapter 3. You got the same genealogy, just in reverse. And it goes through Abraham. In Abraham, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Not through Isaac, not through Jacob, not through Joseph, not through Israel, but through Jesus, the one to come. If the Jews are exterminated by Haman's plot, Christ cannot come. Now keep that in mind as we go through chapter 4. If this happens according to Haman's plot, Christ will not come. If Christ does not come, Haman's plot is set to affect all of mankind, you and me today. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, If Christ has not risen from the dead, of all people, we are most miserable. You take Christ out of history... And we're the most miserable people on the earth. If Haman's plot succeeds, that's the result. 
Back to chapter 4, verses 1 and 2 of Esther. How does Mordecai react when he hears this? When Mordecai learned all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, went out to the midst of the city and wailed loudly and bitterly. He went as far as the king's gate, for no one was to enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. It seems that Mordecai had some kind of position at the palace gate. Whether he was a watchman, whether he was a porter, whether he was the guy that held the key, we don't know. But it seems like he had some limited access, at least, to that area of the king's courtroom. Not in the king's court, but in the outer court at the gate. And it seems like, from what I've read, there are like three separate areas there. There's the main gate and a large court, but well, you can put this building in. And then there's another gate and another court, and then another gate, and then you got the king's uh, throne room there. So there was a process to get through there. And Mordecai seems to have been in that general vicinity with some kind of a position there. He could walk around in that area and could be seen by Esther and her maidens. So there was some, some kind of, uh, it appears there was some kind of communication between him and Esther. There's some way that they could not communicate personally since she was the queen, but he could, you know, they know what's going on. So Mordecai learned. He learned about this decree. He didn't just go read it on the column. Seems like he found out some of the things behind it, as we'll see in just a minute. He knew some things that were not written on the edict, that on the, what, the 13th day of the month of Adar, the last month of the year, which would have been 11 or 12 months from that date, all the Jews would be exterminated. He got that. Everybody got that. He went and found out why, what's going on behind it, and what Haman had plotted to do. So when he learned that, he tore his clothing. And then he put on sackcloth. And you sprinkle ashes on the head. And it's not just a few that look like dandruff. It's a handful. And it's all over one's head, hair. And it's a public demonstration of his mourning. And he went out to the middle of the city. He didn't just stay in his little cubby hole. He went out and walked around the city wailing loudly and bitterly. Now, I don't mean to be insensitive. I know we had a funeral yesterday, a celebration yesterday. We have one again today, and we've got another one next Saturday. But have you ever been to a funeral, and you've got a professional wailer there? Someone who, right in the middle of the eulogy, begins to wail. They're not necessarily affiliated with the family. You think they just came in off the street, and they sit over here, and they begin to wail. And anyone who is emotionally upset, very tender-hearted, they're going to begin to cry, and before long, they're going to begin to wail. It's catching. You're going to try that out? Go outside tonight about 8 o'clock, 8.30, and start barking like a dog. Every dog in the community will start barking. It's going to go all over town. Because you started, there. it's the same idea. You get one going, and the rest of them are going to go. I saw, I was at one funeral, and the, I don't know if it was the mother or the, the widow of the deceased had to actually be physically almost carried out of the auditorium. And the one who started the wailing was sitting over there smiling because she had got it going. Very emotional. Mordecai goes throughout the town and starts up, but what in the world's going on? Before long, they're reading and they're wailing and they're crying. And they're putting on sackcloth and ashes because of Mordecai's influence on them. So it began catching. Verse 4. Esther's maidens and her eunuchs came and told her, and the queen writhed in great anguish. Why is Mordecai in mourning? She didn't know. And so she sent garments to clothe Mordecai that he might remove his sackcloth from him, but he did not accept them. Did her maidens tell Esther of the decree? I don't think they knew. I think they told her of Mordecai's actions because she sends him clothing. Why? Did he not have a closet? 
Now, the idea was he is near the king's gate. Now, you can't go past the king's gate dressed in these clothing, morning clothing. Okay, he had sackcloth and ashes, you can't go there. So he had to stop there. There's probably a guard there, a couple of guards there, with lances or spears or swords or whatever, saying, no, you ain't coming any closer, dude. So he's actually standing out there. So Esther finds out what's going on. She sends him clothing. So once properly clothed, he can come into the court and maybe get close enough to convey to her some messenger how this is working. But he refused the clothing, indicating that it's not something that fresh clothes will do. This is a major, major affair. So we've got to do something serious. So, verse 5. Esther summoned Hathak from the king's eunuchs, whom the king had appointed to attend her, and ordered him to go to Mordecai to learn what this was and why it was. There are several groups of individuals that are involved in this narrative. Hathak, who was one of the chief eunuchs of the king, who had been specifically appointed to oversee Esther. Now, the king is living in the lap of luxury. So is the queen. She has at least one eunuch who's in charge of everything she needs. And she has a handful of maidens. Now, these are not out of that group of people that were pulled in to be possible queens or candidates for the queen and went through that process, one night stand with the king, got sent to second harem. No, these are maidens assigned to Esther. We do not know if they were Jewish or if they were not Jewish. They may have been from all over the empire. And remember, the empire goes from Macedonia to India to Ethiopia. So you've got a number of different races represented there. We don't know who these ladies were, but their job was to see that Esther did not need anything. I mean, a wiggle of her finger, she got a manicure. A long sigh, and she got whatever she wished. That was these maidens' responsibility. And I think she had a couple of them that were positioned to keep an eye out the window to watch for Mordecai. Maybe they waved at him. Gave him the okay sign, a thumbs up, to let him know that everything was fine with Esther because he was constantly caring about her, although he could not approach her because of her uh, position as the queen. So, verse 6, Hathak went out to Mordecai to the city square in front of the king's gate, and Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the exact amount of money that Haman had promised to pay to the king's treasury for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict which had been issued in Susa for their destruction, that he might show Esther and inform her and to order her to go into the king to implore his favor and to plead with him for her people. Mordecai gives Hathak all the details, not just a copy that he Maybe he tore one off the post, or maybe he took a piece of paper and copied it down, but he had a copy of it so that she would know what was going on officially, not just word of mouth. But Mordecai had learned how much Haman had offered to pay to have this done. So he realized this is not just a simple affair. Hey, fact, we're in trouble. And he orders... Esther to go to the king. All right, get this picture. In our imagination, we have an older man and an elderly man sending an order to the queen of the Persian Empire. You know how that's going to work, don't you? I mean, most of us married men know there's not a way you can order your wife to do anything. Is Haman going to order the queen? He does. And some translations have tried to simplify this and say he encouraged her, he uh, recommended, uh, he offered a supplication to her. No, the Hebrew word there is order. It's a commandment. 
It's kind of the same root word that's used in the Ten Commandments. It's that same idea. This is not a if you can, want to, after you have your Hershey's bar and a cup of coffee, go in it. No, this is a direct order from her cousin to go to the king. Why not say, Esther, you need to request an audience with the king so you can explain to find what's going on. That's a good idea. Ain't going to work. Because if you want to approach the king, you bring in your request, and you have to explain what you want with the king. So Esther goes to and says, I need to see the king and tell him I am a Jew. And this edict that has been sent out is going to affect me personally. That statement must be given to Haman. He's the one who let you in to see the king. It ain't going to work, is it? Haman's not going to let her do that. So she has got to bypass all of the regular protocol to go see the king. Verse 9. Hathak comes back and relates Mordecai's words to Esther. Then Queen Esther spoke to Hathak and ordered him to reply to Mordecai. Same thing. She ordered Hathak. She could do that. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that any man or woman who comes to the king to the inner court who is not summoned, he has but one law, that he be put to death, unless the king holds out to him the golden scepter so that he may live. And I have not been summoned to come to the king for these 30 days. So they told Mordecai what Esther said. He hadn't called me for a month. There we go. I have not been summoned for 30 days. Now we said, well, wait a minute. Isn't she the queen? Isn't she his, his favorite wife? Hashiris was a polygamist. He had a number of wives, a number of queens. Esther was just one of the many. And he had other things going on besides going to see Queen Esther. And for at least a month, he had not called her to come see him. Now she is going to walk into his inner court where you're not supposed to go without an announcement, without a summons, without an invitation, or without a request being made through Haman. And the rule is, anybody who does so, they're executed immediately. Unless the king, and we've got, uh, I'd say pictures, but the actual word is reliefs, carvings, of the king having a long scepter, which he would extend towards that individual. And that's the only thing that would save me. He hadn't called me for a month. What am I going to do? Here's Mordecai's reply, verse 13. Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, Do not imagine that you in the king's palace can escape any more than all the Jews. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, and you and your father's house will perish. And who knows? whether you have not attained royalty for such a time as this. Folks, that's as close to God as we're going to find anything said in this book. But Mordecai is very specific. Don't think because you're the queen, sequestered in the harem, protected by the eunuchs, that you're going to escape. This edict kills all the Jews. And if you refuse to participate in undermining this plot, God is going to raise up somebody else. God will not allow his promises and his covenants to fail. God keeps his promises. And if you don't go, God's going to do something else. But you are our best bet right now. Because who knows that you're there that God and his providence has worked it out, that you're there right now for this specific time. Come back to that in a minute. 
So Esther presents her plan. All right, here's what you do, Mordecai. You go assemble all the Jews found in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, and night or day. I and my maidens also will fast in the same way. And thus I will go into the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away, did just as Esther had commanded. All right, cousin, go get all the Jews. Everybody in town, they've already been alerted. They've read the, the decree. And this may be Sunday or Monday after the decree went out. Get everybody together. Y'all meet and fast for me. Now, involved in this fasting is the idea of prayer. Fasting is not not eating. That's called a diet. Fasting means that we do not concentrate or spend time preparing food and drink. Keep in mind, they didn't have microwaves back then. They didn't have refrigerators. So if you want lunch, I remember my grandmother telling me that she would get up at four in the morning to start fixing breakfast. Had no idea how many people were going to be there for breakfast. Now she knew she had 13 kids that would show up, but how many uncles and aunts and cousins, field workers, passers-by that just, by the way, come on and eat breakfast with us, they're going to show up. And as soon as the breakfast was done and cleaned up, they started cooking lunch. And as soon as that was done, they started cooking supper. As soon as that was done, they went to bed and got up at four and did it all over again. They spent all day long basically in the kitchen preparing food for the meals of that day. Because if they had steaks for supper that night, Somebody had to go out that morning after breakfast and kill the fatted calf. And it takes some time to clean them, to cook them. It wasn't go look in the refrigerator and see, or freezer and see what we got and thaw it out. No, it, was, and it wasn't a microwave. It was an all-day process. If we're spending all day long in the kitchen cooking food, we don't have time to pray. But if we start fasting, we deny the physical to emphasize the spiritual we might eat some leftover bread. We may drink a little sip of water. We're not going to completely just dehydrate and shrivel up and die away. It's only for three days. Be careful on the three days. We try to make that out 72 hours. Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So the son of man will be in the belly of the earth three days and three nights. Well, we've got to get him in there for 72. There ain't no possible way to do that. It's a figure of speech. Someone asked me, did you have a busy week? How do you answer that? There are seven days in a week. How busy was each individual day? And most of the time at night, between midnight and six, I'm trying to sleep. I'm not always successful, but I'm trying. So how do you explain, yes, I have had a busy, well, Six hours on Friday, or three hours on Friday, six hours on Wednesday, no. Let's be, you know, that's a generic term. Same thing here. Because on the third day, Esther goes to the king. So they go to fast for three days, night and day. They stay up, stay up all night long praying for Esther. I and my maids are going to do the same. Now, this group of maidens who have been appointed to her, regardless of their ages, some may be older, some may be younger, but their job for the next three days or so was to do nothing but to pray with, that, with Esther. Now, think about that for a moment. What kind of power did she have over them that she could require them, or did they volunteer? Had she already taught them about God? What kind of an influence did she have on them and set before them, did they know she was a Jewish? Did Hathak know she was a Jew? We really don't know. But I'll go. And if I die, <laughs> I'll either die then or I'll die later. I'm going to go. 
but let's pray about it first. I read this statement the other day on this passage here. You are valuable to God, but you're not vital. I thought, mm, that's pretty sharp. That's what Mordecai says to Esther. If you don't go, God's going to raise somebody else up. You are valuable. You are necessary for God, but you're not the only dog in the hunt. You're not the only thing God's got to do. There's somebody else if you don't. But I got question marks about this because I got thinking about this. I'm not real sure. Yes, every single one of us is valuable to God. A God who knows when a squirrel or, or a sparrow or a dove or a tadpole dies. A God who knows how much hair you got in your head. You're very valuable to God. But are you vital? I think we are. You are both valuable and vital to God. I read this a long time ago. There was a job at the church, a ministry, however you want to say it. Everybody thought somebody should. And it was something that anybody could do, but nobody did. There's something that all of us think ought to be done. And it's something that anybody could do, and somebody should, but it's the nobodies who get it done. It's the nobodies that are the vital people. Now, are we sitting back here thinking, well, God values me, but I am not vital? Oh, no, you're wrong. God needs each one of us involved in the work of the church. Not all of us stand up here or stand up there, but we all have a vital part. Look at your physical body. Which part is not vital? Now, God don't make no junk. So whatever God put in the body is there for a reason. We might not understand it, we might not like it, but it's there. Every part of us is vital to the existence of the body. Now, yeah, surgically we can remove parts. And with medicine we can get along without parts. And with treatments we can get along without some things acting right. Medically we can do that. But to begin with, we are all vital to the body and valuable because we are in the church for such a time as this. Don't look around and say, well, used to. Mm -mm. I had a lady one time, we asked her to teach vacation Bible school. She taught public school for however many years, third grade. Can you teach the third grade students for vacation Bible school? Oh, I've retired from teaching. I got that. Have you retired from the Lord? She taught vacation Bible school. She was vital. But she had thought her vitality was no longer needed. She realized she was valuable to God, but she didn't realize that God needed her. Oh, by the way, the children loved it. And she continued to be involved. We can't retire until we are in heaven. And then we'll be busy doing something else. We are here for just such a time as this. That's what I've got this morning. Thank you. God bless you. Have a great week. We're dismissed.